ora. My name is Tony Ballantyne. I'm a professor of history here at the University of Otago and I'm also the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Humanities. I'm here in the council chamber. This room was originally the first library for the university. Now it is the ceremonial centre of the university where our governing bodies, the Senate and the council meet. This is a very good place to share some thoughts about the history of our institution. Behind me, you can see the Reverend Dr. Thomas Burns. He is well known, of course, as the nephew of the great poet, Robbie Burns. But he was a very important figure in early Otago. He was the principal minister for the Otago colony. He was also the first chancellor for our university. And he is the great, great, great grandfather of our current chancellor, Dr. Royden Somerville. The establishment of the university is inextricably linked with the development of the city of Dunedin and the province of Otago. Otago, of course, was established as a colony in 1848. There was a distinctive understanding of the role of education in early Otago, a vision that was shaped by the religious and cultural outlook of the Scottish colonists, most of whom were Free Church Presbyterians. They saw education as the foundation stone for their faith, for the routines of civilised life, and also for the progress of society. In Scotland, education was relatively open and it was available to individuals from a range of backgrounds. In part, this was because Scottish universities were important training grounds for the clergy but it also reflected a strong practical orientation as well, where training in the sciences was valued for its utility in terms of agriculture and industry, and where legal and medical training was also held in very high regard. The idea of a university seemed distant in the early years of Otago. The population grew slowly, resources were limited, and it was a struggle to develop the need in itself, as the roads were choked with mud and the infrastructure was rudimentary. The discovery of large gold deposits in 1861 radically changed things. Colonists flooded into the region. Gold made the young colony energetic and restless. Everything sped up. The city grew rapidly. Colonists established new workshops, factories and stores, Banks and insurance companies supported the growth of trade and shipping, and churches and educational institutions proliferated. The establishment of a university was seen as key to promoting advanced knowledge in the professions, the sciences, and in the arts. Graduates with specialist skills were needed for an increasingly complex colonial society. The idea of developing a university gained greater currency in the mid-1860s with some strong support from leaders in Otago like the provincial superintendent James McAndrew and from Thomas Burns. Many other public leaders were sceptical. One parliamentarian dismissed the idea as absurd when the central government concluded that New Zealand was not yet ready for a university, leaders in Otago decided to go it alone. Many Otago colonists were supportive and so was the Presbyterian Church. It agreed to fund two of the four foundation professorships here at the university. Otago's provincial government passed an ordinance on the 3rd of June, 1869, to establish the university. Much work had to be done to actually create a working university. The professors had to be hired and convinced to relocate to the far edge of the British Empire. A building needed to be fixed upon, courses of study had to be agreed, and of course, students had to be recruited. The university was conjured into being really swiftly out of the ideas, debates, and the incredible energy of a cohort of community leaders who saw education as a powerful engine that would drive the colony forward. The teaching at the university was in the Scottish style, based on lectures by the professors. 
the expertise of those first professors also echoed Scottish universities, where classics, philosophy and mathematics were emphasised. But it also reflected a colonial interest in making the most of natural resources. And the fourth chair here was in the natural sciences. The ordinance that established the university in 1869 was explicit in stating that all classes and denominations of people were welcome. The proponents of the creation of this university were influenced by the egalitarianism of Presbyterianism and they were consciously setting themselves against English models which barred certain religious denominations and also which favoured the sons of the elite. The importance of our Scottish connections are symbolised by the Edinburgh Stone that sits in the heart of our Dunedin campus. When the university opened in July 1871, there were 81 students and they were from a range of social backgrounds. They were not all rich and most of them worked as well as studying. But they were unified by two things. They were all men and they were all Pākehā or of European descent. Colonial women were very keen to study. There had been a vigorous campaign to establish a secondary school for girls in the city and that was a first in the Southern Hemisphere. A petition was swiftly put together and in August 1871, with the university still in its earliest infancy, the University Council agreed to admit women. Women enrolled at Otago from 1872, and in 1885 we had our first female graduate, Carolyn Freeman. In 1896, Emily Seiderberg became New Zealand's first female medical graduate. And in the following year, Ethel Benjamin was the first woman to graduate with a Bachelor of Laws. By 1900, Otago had produced 58 female graduates. In the 20th century, and especially from the late 1960s on, many more women enrolled. Now approximately 60% of our students are female. The colonial nature of our university was undoubtedly a significant barrier to Māori students enrolling. While Te One Jack Tairoa, a renowned Naitahu sportsman from an influential family, studied in the 1880s and played rugby for the university and cricket, it was not until 1904 that we had our first Māori graduate, Te Rangi Hiroa, or Peter Buck. Te Rangi Hiroa had a very distinguished career uh, as a doctor and as an anthropologist working in Hawaii and also at Yale University. We are very proud to have a residential college that bears his name. And in fact, he left his mark here on one of the benches that adorns the wall of our council chamber. Naitahu families provided welcome manakitanga for many Māori students, but it took the university a long time to begin to recognise the importance of Māori, to support the sustained teaching of te reo Māori and Māori culture, and to begin to adequately recognise Naitahu Whanui's special status as mana whenua. We now work very hard to support Māori students, to encourage te reo and Māori tikanga as part of the fabric of university life, and to build strong connections and relationships with iwi and a range of community organisations. Those commitments are only going to become more significant as we move into the future. To my mind, the transformations we have seen in the last two to three decades are very significant. With the establishment of Tatumu, which is our School of Māori, Pacific and Indigenous Studies, with the work of the Māori Centre, or Te Huka Maturaka, and the Office of Māori Development. These initiatives have marked a very substantial move away from our colonial origins, and they will play an increasingly significant role as we move into the future.
students from the Pacific were also drawn to Otago. Following on from our first Pacific student, Gione Tom Dovi from Fiji, who enrolled in 1929, a number of scholars from the Pacific also studied at Otago before going on to notable political careers. These included Kamase Simara, who served as the Prime Minister and then President of Fiji for over two decades, and also Tom Davis, who became Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. From the 1970s, growing numbers of New Zealand-born students of Pacific descent began to enrol at the university. Pacifica students and those students who come to study at Otago from across the Pacific region are now an integral part of the university. We are proud of the great support that they get from the university's Pacific Island Centre and from the Office of Pacific Development. We are working hard to build our connections within and across Te Moana Nui Akiwa and to more fully realise the opportunities that come from our own Pacific location. International students have also become more important with time at Otago, and again, they have transformed our university. In the 1960s and the 1970s, significant groups of students arrived from both Asia and from Africa. Asian connections grew from the 1990s, but Otago also has very strong links to Europe and North America as well. Today, our university is truly global, with more than 2,500 international students from over 100 countries. The changing face of our student population echoes the broader transformation of the university. We have travelled a long way from 1869. New areas of study and professional programmes have been established. Innovative areas of research have been opened up and the structure of the university has shifted over time. The university has always been dynamic, needing to respond to changes in research methods, shifts in forms of teaching, technological innovations, changing government funding and new patterns of student interest. The university has become a lot larger and more complex. We've gone from 81 students in 1871 to 20,000 today. Our staff here at the university are incredibly international. Many come from overseas or they're like me. They're New Zealanders with postgraduate qualifications from abroad. We have also become a truly national university with our campuses in Christchurch and Wellington becoming very, very important parts of Otago. We also have significant centres for teaching and outreach in Invercargill and Auckland. And our students carry out research and they are on placements throughout New Zealand and in a, a wide number of countries internationally. The physical footprint of the university has changed markedly. Initially, teaching was carried out from a site on Princess Street in the centre of the young city. We only moved here to our current main site in Dunedin in 1879. In that year, the registry building with its signature clock tower came into use. It has become an icon of our university, but construction was difficult and there were cost overruns. Our clock tower was actually without a clock until 1930. Only then did TK Sidey the University Chancellor, who was well known as the father of daylight saving in New Zealand, then he donated the funds for the clock to be installed. Sometimes good things do take time. Developing our campus has frequently posed challenges. Government funding has often been constrained and our resources scant. But we have managed those resources carefully and that mindset has been elaborated and refined as we now lead the way in our commitment to sustainability. We can take real pride in our campuses today. In recent times, our Dunedin campus has been ranked as one of the 15 most beautiful university campuses in the world. Residential colleges have been a feature of Otago since the opening of the first college, Selwyn, in 1893. 
They became increasingly prominent as the university grew in the 1960s and 70s. Unicol, for example, was built in 1969 to mark the university's centenary. Today, the colleges are not only great places to live, but they provide top-class academic and pastoral support for students. They are simply integral to campus life. For many young people, studying at Otago is not only a path to a great career, but it's also a rite of passage. Living in a residential college, sharing a flat with mates, and having a great time are key parts of the Otago experience. Our students have always been politically engaged. They've always been energetic and enthusiastic. They have embodied the motto that the founders of our university selected, Sapere Aude, dare to be wise. This comes from both the Roman poet Horace and the great Enlightenment philosopher, Immanuel Kant. It encourages us to recognise the importance of education and to get to work using the power of our intellects to make sense of the world and to make it a better place. I was an undergraduate student here at Otago and the great teaching I received from the history department changed my life. I care deeply about this university. I love teaching here, doing research and working here every day. The University of Otago has made a huge difference to my family as a whole. My parents were born in the late 1920s, just before the Depression. World War II broke out before they were teenagers, and as a result, they both had limited educational opportunities. They also ended up having a really big family. I'm the youngest of 11 kids, so my parents never had much money. But they clearly understood the importance of reading and the great value of education, both to enrich your life and to enhance your opportunities. As a result of their commitment, almost all of our family had some tertiary education, the majority of them here at Otago. It is no coincidence that most of us then have carried on to become educators of some kind. Those careers pay the gift of education forward to the next generation. That's my Otago story. But for each and every one of our students, all of our graduates, and for all of our current and former staff, each one of those have their own Otago memories. Collectively, those stories make up the rich history of our university. I would encourage you to read Alison Clark's excellent new history of the university, which gathers together and reflects upon those stories. Please also participate in the 150th programme there is a host of alumni events in New Zealand and around the world, as well as a sequence of celebrations here in Dunedin and on our other campuses. We have a great deal to celebrate and even more to look forward to. The University of Otago continues to develop. Our connections within New Zealand and the Pacific strengthen and multiply, and our global reach grows. The University will continue to change and adapt, and it will be fascinating to see what the future holds. During 2019, there will be a lot of reflection, but also important discussions about that future. I would encourage you to join in, be part of those conversations, and enjoy the year ahead. Kia ora.